Hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Hal Lavinka, and I'm the event director at the bookstore, and I'm thrilled today to be collaborating with our friends at Ugly Duckling Press to welcome Mona Karim for her, a discussion of Rad Abdul Qadir's Except for This Unseen Thread uh, in Mona's translation in conversation with Sinan Antoun. While the pandemic has taken a toll across all of our lives, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in our days, and I want to give a huge thanks to our guests for joining us tonight. So to some housekeeping, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they can not see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button here at the bottom of the screen to submit them. Uh, we'll be asking those at the end of the program. There's also a chat button here through which I'll be posting a link to purchase tonight's book, very important. Um, a caveat for tonight's event, we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads. So please bear with any technical issues that could arise. We will try to solve them quickly. Uh, and finally, we've scheduled a whole host of summer programming. Uh, so head over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I do wanna point out next month on Tuesday, June 22nd. We're continuing our NYRB series, uh, and we're thrilled to welcome Joshua Cohen for the release of his scathing, brilliant new novel, The Netanyahu's In Conversation with, in conversation with Curtis Sittenfeld. Uh, that program is up on our website now, and I will be posting a link to register it for in, in the chat. So now a little about tonight's guest, and we'll get started. Mona Karim is the author of three poetry collections and most recently the trilingual chatbook Femme Ghosts. She hosts, uh, holds a PhD in comparative literature and is a translator in residence at Princeton University. Her translation include Octavia, uh, Octavia Butler's Kindred into Arabic and Ashraf Fayyad's Instructions Within, which was long listed for the BTBA 2017 awards. And Sinan Antoun is an Iraqi-born poet, novelist, scholar, and translator. He has published two collections of poetry and four novels, the most recent being The Book of Collateral Day. Image. His translation include in the absence or in the presence of absence by Mahmoud Darwish, which won the American Literary Translators Association Prize, and Sadi Youssef's Nostalgia My Enemy. He is the co-founder and co-editor of Jadalia and associate professor at New York University. So I'm going to turn things over to the two of you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Hal. <laughs> um, hi, Sinan. And um, yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, tonight we're talking about, um, except for this unseen thread, um, you can see it's a bilingual uh, edition uh, by Ra'ad Abdel Qadir, an Iraqi poet. Um, and I'm really grateful for Sinan for joining me on uh, to talk about Ra'ad, but also about the Iraqi poetry, Iraqi prose poem, literary translation. And um, I guess I, I would like to start with you to, uh, you know, maybe tell us how your impression and uh, um, uh, of, of this collection and, and of Raad and, and um, yeah, I'll let you do that first. Thank you so much, Mona. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really delighted and honored to be here to celebrate your wonderful translation and to, to thank you. Uh, on behalf of, uh, you know, readers of poetry, but also readers who are interested in, in Iraqi and Arabic poetry and poetry and translation. Um, because I think, uh, as you say in the introduction, Ra'ad Abdel Qadir is a really unique voice in the history of Iraqi poetry, modern Iraqi poetry, and even in contemporary uh, Arabic poetry. And, and every translation really is an important addition um, uh, to the landscape of poetry. And the truth is, and, and maybe we'll get more into detail into this afterwards, is that Iraqi poetry is uh, relatively underrepresented, I think, in Anglophone academic and, and literary spheres and circles. We do have a few poets that are translated into English, but um, we should have much more considering the importance of poetry in Iraq in contemporary and modern culture. I mean, uh, Mahmoud Darwish famously said, kun, kun Iraqiyan, uh, be an Iraqi to be a poet. I, I always say, in a way, poetry in Iraq is like soccer in Brazil, in a way. Right. And um, um, because of the, the political conditions, the, the devastating wars and sanctions, uh, Iraqi culture and Iraqi society was cut off from its uh, Arab world and from the world at large from 1990 until 2003. And all Iraqi citizens, including poets, lived under very difficult conditions. 
And as you say in the introduction, in a way, of course, such uh, conditions of collective violence, of wars and sanctions, um, you know, I think make the task of artists and writers much more challenging and difficult because there is a tendency or a desire to write with ease. And I think Ra'ad Abdul Qadir's poetry is one of a few examples that really speak to the darkness of that period uh, in a very unique way. Um, I think also compared to his contemporaries and compared to his generation, uh, his generational divisions in Iraqi literary history are problematic, but sometimes they're useful. But he stands out in the type of poetic voice that he employs, which you brought so beautifully into English. He's very self-effacing. Um, there is no central subjectivity and narcissistic individuality. The poetic persona is in a way embedded in beings and inhabits objects, space and time and coincides with and in them. And that's borne out also, I think, by his, uh, uh, his study of Arabo-Islamic history. He holds a PhD in Islamic philosophy. And as we discussed earlier, in a way, he has a very uh, a, a, a rare, rare and unique, healthy, what I call a healthy relationship to the indigenous or Arabo-Islamic poetic past that, that we see in his poetry. The language and the diction are unique and heterogeneous. It's um, simple and aesthetic, but very deep. Uh, there is no need for the fireworks or the shocking acrobatics that one finds or one used to find in the prose poets of the 70s, the language is precise and very evocative and leaves an emotional aftertaste. Um, and then of course, there is the strong element of narrative in the poetry. And I think we can talk about the themes afterwards. Um, as I said, the themes of sanctions, the themes of war and collective death. Um, but uh, I mean, I think this is a very important contribution to our to Anglophone readers and to our understanding of the landscape of modern Iraqi poetry. And it would not be an exaggeration to say, I think also the Iraqi prose poem is short shrifted when it comes to mainstream narrative of literary history, which focus so much on the Lebanese uh, genealogy and the Adonis school and so on and so forth. And at the expense of a very important uh, phase in the development of the Arabic prose poem that took place in Iraq that maybe we can talk about later. But perhaps we, um, you could read one of the poems that you wanted to read. And then after that, um, I just want to ask you a couple of questions about the, the translation and, and about Ra'ad. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Sinan. A lot of the things you said, you know, I feel like we, we can um stop at you know and, and and examine more but um i also would like you to to read a poem um and we decided before this event that we would also read in arabic uh you know in case uh, you know some ears love a foreign language and also some some ears also do speak arabic so um i was gonna read um <clears throat> Hayakil Tayur Yes, okay. Hayakil Tayur Mahzumun, Ultulaka Sanava on Nihaya Likul Shay Say to the Wakun, Tamal Hazima. سيشربون كأسها قطرة قطرة قلت لك سينهزمون في النهاية وسنضع حدا لكل شيء لكل شيء سيغلقون علينا المنافذ سينصبون لنا الفخاخ سيستدرجوننا إلى الشباك سنسقط فيها سيرفعون عنا الأغصان والأوراق ويلتقطوننا واحدا واحدا وسيحملوننا في الأقفاص مخدرين من الألم دون مقاومة ودون ما أي صرخة وسينقلوننا إلى المتاحف هياكلنا العظمية ستعرض في المتاحف سيتركوننا هناك في الظلمة والبرد منسيين 
فارغين من الحب والكره والخوف والحزن والأمل صامتين لا نعني أحدا لا تلقى علينا الشباك لا نستدرج إلى الفخاخ لا يأبه أحد بنا ولا يلقى علينا حتى نظرة ازدراء حياكل فارغة بلا أجنحة أو غناء آخرون سيأتون لينقذوا المدينة متسللين بأسلحتهم إلى داخل المتاحف وسيطلقون النار على الأعداء من خلف هياكلنا وسننتصر ننتصر ألم أقل لك إنهم مهزومون في النهاية مهزومون Yeah, this poem gives me the chills, you know. <laughs> um, and it's it's crazy that this man, you know, died in January 2003, literally like a few months or weeks before the U.S. invasion. Bird skeletons. Defeated, I told you. We will put an end to everything. They will taste defeat. They will drink from its cup drop by drop. I told you they will be defeated at the end and we will put an end to, all, to it all. They will shut the exits before us. They will set the traps for us. They will lure us into the nets. We will fall for it. They will lift the leaves and branches, plucking us one by one. They will carry us in cages, numbed with pain, without resistance or screaming. They will move us into the museums, our skeletons exhibited. They will leave us there in the cold and dark, forgotten, empty, of love or hate, of fear, sadness, of hope, silent, of no concern to anyone. Nobody will cast the nets on us. Nobody will lure us into traps. Nobody will care about us or look at, look at us with contempt. Empty skeletons without wings or songs. Others will come in and save the city, sneaking into the museums with their guns, standing behind our skeletons. They will shoot at the enemy and we will win. We will win. Didn't I tell you they will be defeated in the end? Defeated? Hello. So I will, before asking you, I'm going to read a short poem. Um, called Al Kharaj wa Dakhil, Outside, Inside, which to my mind is, as with great poetry, Ba'd Abdul Qadir's ability to transform a mundane ephemeral moment into something uh, filled with the magic of poetry. Al Kharaj wa Dakhil, Al Mataru Yahtulu bi Ghazaratin, Masihatu Sayarati Tulawihu Kaadru al Gharqa, Al Unufu Multasikatun bi Zujaj. والأيدي غائصة في المقاعد داخل السيارة كانت السماء صاحية في المرآة والأشجار تومض بالزقزقات والمفاتيح تتدلى إلى الأرض كالعناقيد Outside, inside The rain is pouring heavily The windshield wipers are waving like drowning arms Noses are glued to the windows hands sinking in the flesh of chairs. Inside the car, the sky looks awake in the mirror. The trees glow with twittering sounds and the keys are dangling over the earth like clusters. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was gonna ask you about kind of telling us about your initial encounter with, with Rad the poet and his poetry and how you decided and why you decided to to translate him and then what were the challenges in rendering his work in english um yes i want to i i i want to say that the first time i read Rad was big i think around 2005 or 2006 you know it was and maybe you remember Sina, like how much the internet played a big role in 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 you know like uh bringing uh the Iraqi literature scene that is inside, you know, of course, there's this division inside, outside, <laughs> as this poem also. Um, yeah, so, uh, and, and yeah, like, everyone was just eager to, to read those poets who nobody knew about, you know, except the people inside or, you know, whoever was able 
to be in touch with them. So I remember uh, uh, like exchanging these poems with, with Iraqi poets like of my age or uh, a bit older um, and feeling like, wow, this, this, is, this is so different, you know, this is so different uh, um, like of an Iraqi poet, but also an Arabic poetry. poetry. I haven't experienced uh, such a poet that always has a, a subject, always has like a, a one scene that, you know, doesn't necessarily flash, you know, it doesn't like blind you, you know, it's like, it, it's, it's always like quiet, but under this quietness, there is this, you know, of course, the horror and, and, and the tragedy. So I, as a, being a poet myself and a prose poet, you know, um, I was always like busy with, you know, how do you break language and how do you, you know, by breaking language, what do you, what uh, strange images can you can you create? And meanwhile, you encounter this poet who is not really concerned with that. He's not concerned with like uh, how you know, like let's say language muscles. You know, he is rather concerned with like um, you know, like these these stories. And and I noticed that he always uses the word a lot of or sentiments. You know, like sentiments. How do do you communicate these sentiments? Um, um, even the grand feelings of horror or, or, or exile or, or being being left behind is, is another description um, I have of, of, of Raad, you know, it's like he communicate them in these small sentiments um, and through stories or one scene. Um, and I also loved like that, you know, in, in the Arabic prose poem, I feel like uh, even myself guilty of that, you know, we are very much like self-consumed with the individual, you know, and the, and, the, and the individual's like world, you know, and that internal world that you always find in the Arabic prose poem. In Ra'ad, you don't see that. You see that he, like everything happens outside, you know, it, like, of course, there is some poems that are home-based, but even these homes that appear in his poems, you feel like that these homes have been abandoned, you know, or they don't have windows or the windows are, are you know, broken, for example, you know, so like, um, I love that, you know, he, he leaves like that world of the Arabic prose poet and wanders around, you know, and like um, makes poetry out of everything, you know, that's why a lot of people describe him as a filmmaker, right? Like he sees some scene, he sees a car crashing and he makes something out of that, that crashing, you know, something, of course, more philosophical. So, um, yeah, and I loved him since 2006. I always went back to him. I also noticed that, you know, he is one of those poets like who has transformed a lot. You know, when you read his earlier poems, you might find him more lyrical, you know, and I love this, like this kind of like uh, how he, he always transforms himself. Um, and, you know, uh, he stayed with me. And then when I became someone who translates into English, I felt like, you know, this is the kind of poet that you know Americans need to read you know <laughs> you know or like anglophone uh, readers need to read because usually with Arabic literature especially with Iraqi literature there is an expectation that um you gotta be like flashy and sensational with the with the with the pain of the of the people and what this country has gone through and here is a special voice that does something different you know and and does it in a way that is you know I may say universal you know even though this word has become you know, uh, problematic, but, you know, I feel like he, he just travels, you know, even even if you're not someone who has lived in Iraq or, or knows of Iraq, this, these poems somehow touch you. Um, and I really hope, like, you know, how translation sometimes contribute to, to the work of some writer that is not uh, appreciated. I hope that this translation comes in that place. <laughs> Um, no, that's great. I mean, and anything you want to say about certain uh, challenges in the mechanics or in, you know, because of what kind of choices, strategic choices that you have to make in, in terms of uh, translating his syntax or his imagery, if any? Yeah, I, I want to say even when you were reading the outside, inside, and that last, last line, I now read I was like, how do you translate this? Because I feel like he was playing on the, mm -hmm. the, the motion of like, of course the clusters, you know, like the bombs, but also you can think of this as grapes. You can think of this as like, you know, the metal of in the, in the car keys, you know, like he plays on the sounds, like he creates images for the sound. And of course he is able to do this because his Arabic is beautiful. Like it's such a, 
as you said, you know, he is in connection with the canonical Arabic and he borrows from it. So a lot of the times in his poems, you know, you see the simple aesthetic, but then he uses some obscure adjective that activates something, you know, in, in the poem and make you look at the at the sentence differently and the image differently. So sometimes I fail, <laughs> you know, sometimes like it's like uh, I, I couldn't, but sometimes, you know, I would have to, you know, I, I think of it as like a new life for the poem and think, you know, like maybe the poem, yeah, like can be read differently, you know, uh, yeah. with the omission of, of such a small detail here and there. Um, and, and maybe other things uh, like I want to tell you, like I've noticed this, especially with the gender, he has a beautiful way on, because he is so uh, 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 focused on objects, you know, he plays on feminizing objects, you know, which is inherent in Arabic. It's like genius of Arabic, honestly, you know, like that's why I, I feel like ungendering Arabic is sometimes can be problematic, you know, like it's a, it's a powerful thing. Um, so sometimes, you know, I am like, I, the image already like Im implies it, but you know, sometimes it, it passes under the, the eye of like an Anglophone reader. Um, and another thing I wanted to say is the punctuation. Like, mm -hmm. um, I feel, and maybe Sinan, you can tell me what you think about this is, you know, we don't have a, 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 like a science for punctuation in Arabic poetry, you know, like, I feel like, and I noticed this only while as a translator, I'm like, oh, I have to like <laughs> come up with, with punctuation or sometimes you read, especially with Raid, I feel like maybe because this, uh, these poems were published like after uh, he passed, um, that you can tell that punctuation is not finalized. So, you know, I, I had to put a lot of punctuation and then I was like, you know what, let's take it off. You know, punctuation is like, <laughs> you know, it's like um, stifling in a way, you know, I felt, uh, so I tried to minimize it. Um, and, and, you know, like uh, sometimes I would put some punctuation that helps just keep the rhythm of, of, of the scenery of the poem. Um, yeah, so I would say these are the, some of the main challenges like that I, uh, I even enjoyed just like sitting with them and, and, and negotiating them. No, that's, I mean, you, you're right in terms of punctuation. Uh, I, even some of the greatest writers are in Arabic are quite lax with, with the punctuation. And when we want to translate to English where there are strict systems for that, it becomes a, a problem. But what you mentioned about the gender and the objects, I think it's in the, it's, it's so, um, um, a great example is that first poem and now off is no, uh, yes. which you yeah. had wanted to read. Maybe so. Maybe you can read that just so that the audience gets the idea of what he does with the with gender. And now off. بإمكانهن أن يفعلن كل شيء النظر إلى الداخل أو الخارج أن يلاحظن أقل حركة للهواء هن في مكانهن غير مكترثات بما يجري صامتات محدقات مكتفيات سعيدات في قصص غرامهن باختراق الضوء لأجسادهن متمتعات في هذه الوحدة عاليات نوافذ Windows They can do anything Look in or out They can notice the slightest breeze stand still in their place, indifferent to what's happening, silent, staring, intent, happy with their love stories, with the light cutting through their bodies. They enjoy this loneliness of high windows. Hello. Yeah. I think I just wanna, just to emphasize what, what Muna was saying about the kind of the joy of the discovery of of what was what had been written inside Iraq after, because I think it's difficult to overestimate what these sanctions meant in that how, and remember this is in the pre-digital age, but really Iraq was cut off from the world uh, because the, the sanctions were so severe that it affected everything. Even paper, for example, was impossible to to import. So this is when a lot of Iraqi readers and writers resorted to Xeroxing, but it really devastated the Iraqi economy and even the size of uh, newspapers and cultural and literary journals had to be smaller because of the lack of paper. So in a way, it's, uh, this brings me to 
the way uh, Ra'ad Abdul Qadir writes about the daily agony of just going about one's life. So there's a, a really very powerful, beautiful poem uh, which Muna included, it's called In Front of uh, Stone Ovens, Amama Afran al Khubz al Hajariya, which is about the, you know, the queues of citizens waiting for, uh, to buy bread. Um, so I just want to read that. وقفوا طوابير بكل رصانة وكبرياء لم يكلموا بعضهم لم يلتفتوا ينتظرون اللحظة الآسرة اللحظة الفائقة الجمال أحدهم سقطت من يده شمس كقطعة نقد معدني عليها صورة سنبلة وتدحرجت على الأرض الآخرون تحركوا بلا نظام أحدثوا ضجة الشمس غربت والسنبلة سقطت في المياه الآسنة وختمت الأفران الحجرية بالشمع الأحمر وتفرقت الطوابير لقد كان النظام صارما للغاية In front of stone ovens they stand in queues solemn and proud not speaking to each other not turning around waiting on a captivating moment, an enchanting moment. Someone has dropped a sun, like a coin from his hand, on which an ear of wheat is drawn. It's rolling down the ground. People are moving around in no order. They're making noise. The sun sets in the fetid water. The ear fell. The stone ovens are now sealed with red wax. The cues no more strict, the order very so. And that last line is, is really so um, intelligent because it can be read in so many different ways, whether it's about the order of the queue itself or a nivam about you know the entire system of a nivam, the regime. And what you mentioned is, I mean, I know this is all in hindsight, but there was something mythical about Ra'ad Abdel Qadir, even in the timing of his death, as you said, in a way, as if right dying. And some of it's, it's, it's impossible not to read some of his poems as being very prophetic, actually, about the strangers that are going to come to town. But it's very prophetic, at least in the way it's read, in that we're going to end up in museums, you know, and we're going to end up skeletons or extinct birds. Uh, yeah. And, and and I mean, and many many of his poems, you feel like the key is always in the in the last line, right? Like the key to the to the poem. Yes. And, yeah, and um, and I try to even like keep this like playfulness of like as you said, you know, the order could could be understood in different ways. And he always liked you know to to stay subtle because he knows like there's layers to the <laughs> to the to the reality he's capturing and. I, I wanted to mention tonight that like someone, I can't remember who mentioned this to me, but like um, it's such a clever observation that even his fixation on windows, because as you can see in this collection, he, there's always windows. And someone told me like it has to do with, it, it might have to do with the way like even under sanctions, people had to sell their own windows. Like, you know, like people had, you know, to get so resourceful that even the windows would be would be sold. and. And, and you just like realize like there's even that other layer that um, makes of him uh, like the poet as a witness, I guess, right? Like a, a very private layer between the Iraqis themselves, right? Like um, that, that he captures. So it, it, I, I understand when people keep saying he's the poet of the sanctions, you know, because that was such a difficult period to, to, to write about, you know, what do you write about? No, and, and I, I mean, I think if, if you could read this poem, Empty House, because I, I had it in my notes as saying what you were saying now about, it's not only the window, but everything has to be uh, put on sale at the end of the day. It's oh. just, it's so powerful. Yes. <laughs> rendering this, the slow death of sanctions and how, you know, not only how it affected the the bodies of Iraqi citizens, but what it did actually to the entire landscape and to their houses and stripping away their life piece by piece, day after day. Yeah. Would you like to read it or should I read it? Um, 
I can, I can, I can read. <laughs> I'm trying it's to really find my, the... my favorite poem of his, you know, and I like that mirror hunts me, you know. Last slide. Until I'm done, Okay. Um, Yeah, if you found it, maybe you can read it because I can't see it here. I'll read the English and then you read the Arabic. How about that? Okay. okay. Empty house. The mirror stayed calm and quiet as they carried her to the Friday market. She did not object when they wanted to sell her. She was displayed and the house was emptied of her. Yesterday, they buried a bird in the garden and the cage became empty. Today, they carry the empty cage with the quiet mirror to the Friday market. The house is emptied of them. The house has become empty, empty completely. For so long, they live together, the empty cage and the mirror. Beautiful. Yeah, I remember someone telling me like, was the, the house was emptied of her? Like, wouldn't the, this be awkward? I'm like, no, it's specifically this, like the, you know, like the house has been like the, you know, like the house has lost her and she was taken out of the house. Like there, there is a violence be, in, uh, being captured exactly. in the verb, yeah. Al-Bayt al-Farag. Al-Mir'atu ihtafagat bihudu'iha. ظلت صامتة وهم يحملونها إلى سوق الجمعة لم تعترض حين أرادوا بيعها هناك عرضت لقد فرغ البيت منها بالأمس دفنوا الطائرة, الطائرة في الحديقة وظل القفص فارغا واليوم يحملون القفص الفارغ مع المرآة الصامتة إلى سوق الجمعة لقد فرغ البيت منهما لقد أصبح البيت فارغا فارغا تماما ولطالما عاشا سوية القفص الفارغ والمرآة. Beautiful. Beautiful. And I just wanna, I mean, I wanna, the point you made earlier about how sometimes it's in the last line that the, the key to the entire poem. Um, so there is another really uh, wonderful poem and a wonderful translation, of course, which is called uh, Prayer. And I, I mention it also as an example also of writing in the collective, which I think back then many, as we said earlier, as you said, many of these poets were focusing on the on the on the eye, whereas here he has there is no, I think Hussein bin Hamza mentioned it in one of the reviews, that there is no uh, eye in these poems, that the kind of the poet's subjectivity is camouflaged in other things, but there is the collective. There is the we and there is the you, but this one also I want to read it because this also shows the writing about that and that, of course, death and the dead uh, are so prevalent in this in this collection because of the context and what he's writing about. But how the living and the dead are there is the border, the boundary between life and death is no longer there. So I, I'm I'm going to read the Arabic and maybe you read the English, your, trans, your beautiful translation. Yeah. So Salat. Min ajlina. صلوا بحرارة بأمل بتوسل من أجلنا صلوا للمطر بحنان واصلوا صلواتكم سنحفر الأخاديد سنبذر البذور صلوا من أجلنا للزرع والضرع ببكاء ليس شرطا أن تحسن النطق أن تفهم الكلمات فقط واصل الصلاة من أجلنا من أجلنا بحرارة نحن الأموات Wow. <laughs> I love it because also you you know even though it's like the you know like the, it's so moving but also it's sarcastic you know and this is something I noticed that um, yeah like it, it wasn't usual for a poet to be sarcastic you know to be like to have any irony you know especially with this subject matter you know so he is like and I feel like he's even stripping the you prayer Pray for us with affection, with hope, pleading for us. Pray for the rain with tenderness. Keep on praying. We will dig in the furrows. We will plant the seeds. 
pray for us, for the plants and animals with tears. You don't have to enunciate or understand the words. Just keep praying for us with affection, for us, for the dead. And you wonder if like us, like for us, they're dead or for us and the dead, you know, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, um, I, I love that you saw like how he, yeah, like the, you, you, you can feel like there is a friendship with the death, right? Like with the, with the dead, they, they, there is like, they are like companions or something. They, the, the dead didn't leave, like even in that poem, um, uh, the dog's head, you know, I felt it, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I noted them all down because it's the, you know, the son's corpse, the son is, is dead, and then the dead are happy, and he said, uh, even the, exactly, on, and then the age of the book of the dead, and then in the hymn in memory of the falcon, the falcon dying every day in memory of the days where death never ages. So you know, it's death is, death becomes life eternal. Uh, yeah. No, it's um, it's it's really amazing, and I I mean maybe this is a point where we could uh, vent and talk about the what I you know add to what I mentioned earlier. Not because I'm from Iraq and you are connected to Iraq too, but the reality of the you know the this predominant narrative of the evolution of of uh, the Arabic prose poem. Um, more often than not, the Iraqi experience is completely erased. And it's not to monopolize uh, the history of, of the Arabic prose poem, but it, it, it has to be mentioned that in Iraq already in the early 20th century, of course, influenced by Rayhani's visits to Iraq and his writings and Gibran, but already in the beginning of the 20th century, we had some early experiments. Of course, there were concerned more with with meter and with rhyme and breaking that but we have uh, Butti and we have a Zahawi and a Rusafi who made very important inroads early on and were in conversation with other poets in Egypt and elsewhere and then so to quote Fadal al-Azzawi the the so-called free Harakat uh, al hur the revolution of Nazik al-Malaika and Badr Shakir al-Sayab as important as it was in the larger uh, picture, it's actually a compromise with what was suggested in the 20s. And then we have Hussein Mardan in the 1950s, who is really, in a way, uh, the prose poem avant la lettre, although he was not necessarily sophisticated theoretically, but he already started writing uh, prose poetry and writing articles advocating this type of prose poetry in the 1950s. And there are very few uh, studies that point to this. And then, in the, of course, in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Uh, and still, we have in the you know, Iraqi diaspora. So Ra'ad Abdul Qadir, is, is, this translation is very important because it will allow those students and scholars who are interested to look for the um, different narratives or more complicated and nuanced narratives as to the development of uh, the Arabic prose poem. Of course, people know about the uh, Karkuk group and so on and so forth, not enough. And I should say, I mean, what, what's really important is that, as we said, you know, we have translations of um, Saad Yusuf, uh, Hatif Janabi, uh, uh, Dunya Mikhail, uh, Sargon Bolos, um, but that's it basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is so much more to be translated to kind of get a fuller picture of, of this very important school of, 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 uh, of Arabic poetry. So I don't know if you wanted to add something to that. Yeah. I wanted to add, Sinan, you know, like actually a few points. Like one thing is like, because from, from, the, from the timeline that you were just giving us, uh, one thing that I feel like, many people fall in, if not all, is that we seem to understand like the development, the so-called development of Arabic poetry as like having to necessarily, you know, leave something and go into something, you know, like uh, modern, postmodern, uh, prose poem, et cetera, you know, like as if we have to have these errors. When in reality, we have all these experiences 
together happening in the same time, you know, like they all existed simultaneously and developed and changed. And, you know, uh, uh, let's say even some retreated, let's say like the classical verse. Um, so this is one point. Another point is that, as you said, you know, like those studies or even the translators or wh whoever considers uh, uh, the prose poem in, in, in Arabic, they seem to forget like when you study, for example, the 60s poet experience in or like the Lebanese post poem and Sha'ar magazine, for example, who used to publish there? It was also Iraqi poets, you know, like it's like they they first like uh, uh, were, were welcomed into Sha'ar and they were modernizers and, you know, and not only that, they were also literary translators, you know, they translated the French and the English, they played a big role in modernizing Arabic poetry and introducing the prose poem uh, um, you know, as, a, as a, a collective project. It's not just like you write a poem here and there, you know? So all of this is, is sadly, oh, I feel like is uh, overlooked, you know, uh, in, in many ways, you know? And I think the point uh, you made, uh, you know, like quoting Father Azawi is so beautiful because it's like, you know, there's so much fixation on Sayyab and Nazik, but <laughs> meanwhile, there was even more radical things happening uh, at the time, um, you know? so. Um, I also wanted to ask you, Sinan, like maybe you could um, um, tell us about Sargon Boros, just because I feel like um, when I think about the Iraqi prose poem, I think we all think about like Sargon. <laughs> and now, you know, like I, I, I hope like yani, Raid, I think Raid is known for Iraqis, but like, you know, I hope that there will be more Arab interest in him. So, and, and even this division of inside and outside, like this is a rupture that Iraqi poetry experienced that you know, it's hard for others to understand and, and, and you know, like really like uh, follow that line. So, and I know you are writing a book to, about, about Sargon and you mentioned Sargon is translated, but it's interesting that a lot of his translations are self-translations because he lived in the, in the US for so long and he was a translator. So maybe something about Sargon. No, I mean, I'm, I'm very, <laughs> I'm very biased uh, when it comes to Sargon Bolus, but I'm not the only one, but because I just think, you know, he's made such an important contribution. And I, I see similarities actually between Rad and Sargon and that Sargon also, although he was published early on in Sher because of he had already been published in Iraq, but also he had this early opportunity to work with Yusuf Khal and publish in Sher. But then when he came to the United States and went to California, he was kind of also interested in the poetry as a lived experience and was not really hell bent on publishing like so many other poets. And it would be years before he would publish. And even later, I know that Khalid al-Ma'ali, the publisher of Al-Jamal used to, you know, hound him to publish. He was really interested in the poetic experience and not really interested in being part of any of these literary establishments or groups. But these divisions are born out, of course, the, you know, the lethal politics of Iraq in that there were waves of Iraqis and Iraqi, amongst them Iraqi writers who had to leave starting from 1950s when so many of the Iraqi Jews had to leave and, and most of them went to Palestine. That was the first wave uh, it included a lot of Iraqi poets, and it's relevant to our discussion because actually the, some of the Iraqi poets who used to already write prose poetry went to Palestine, and there they played a key role in also disseminating this new type of writing, in addition to being important contributors to writing in Arabic and then in Hebrew. But then with the 70s, I think the big well-known rift between the Ba'ath and the, and the Communist Party ended up and a crackdown on a lot of the communists, especially in the late 70s, meant that hundreds of uh, writers and poets and journalists had to leave Iraq and go to Beirut and London and elsewhere. And the way the Saddam Hussein regime operated and how we were insulated when we were back then, of course, the this notion that writers living abroad were, you know, traitors and whatnot and so on and so forth. So there was this really problematic rift in that many of the, also the writers living abroad tended to just claim that everyone who is writing inside is just a Ba'athist stooge, which is not the case. And for the audience who are 
very young, we have to mention this is in the pre-digital age. This is when you did not have Twitter or Facebook or WhatsApp. And this is when everything was being under surveillance. It was very difficult to, to even make a phone call because people were listening in. It was very difficult to write a letter. So there was really a huge rift between those living inside and those living outside. And the political accusations of, of treason continue until today in a way, but there are figures that can bridge this, I think. And to my mind, Sargon Bolas is just important also for similar reasons that I mentioned with Rad and that, you know, of course he's so well versed in all world traditions and such an amazing translator, but he really, again, has a healthy relationship with the Arabic language and Arabo-Islamic past, that he is in conversation with Abu Tammam, he's in conversation with others also, the way he uses elements from Iraqi dialect and Iraqi mythology. But also, it's, I think it's stunning that someone who left Iraq in 1968 can write about the conditions in Iraq, uh, the war and the destruction. And even one of his poems about the sanctions, about a woman in Amman. Uh, so he just, and it's not just me, it's poets and readers inside Iraq who feel so strongly about Sargon Bolos because also he really developed his unique voice and persona. And like Raad Abdel Qadir, he really does not need to use this high language or resort to all kinds of tricks to camouflage something because he is really after the purity and essence of poetry. I know that might sound a little bit naive, but this is even what Abbas Baydoun, for example, the famous Lebanese poet, wrote about uh, Sargon Bolos's last collection. He said, this is what Sargon has done here is just pure poetry mm -hmm. without um, without al and all of that. So that's why I'm very drawn to, to Sargon Bolos and also just because of the type of poetry that, he, that he's writing also, frankly, because of the mis- Again, the common misunderstanding of Sargon Bolas. So many Iraqi poets and, and critics and Arab critics write all that Sargon was not political. Mm. Of course, it depends on what you mean by not being political. But actually, if you read his poetry carefully, you realize that already, I mean, he's also unique because he started out being very bohemian and liberal in a way, but by living in the United States and you know, being radicalized in San Francisco and through the 80s, he begins to actually write about uh, United States, about what empire means and the 1991 Gulf War, as he himself said in several interviews was a huge shock for him in that what, where he says America is not Whitman's America. This is the America of generals who are thirsty for blood. And this is when he begins to go more to Berlin and basically wants to distance himself from America. So strangely, there is a, there is a lot of love for Sargon Bolos, but there are also myths about Sargon yeah. Bolos. There is also the other problem of, of sectarianizing even literary criticism and that, you know, he's always categorized as the Assyrian poet. He is a Syrian, of course, but anyway, I don't want to go too much into that, but hopefully my book will... Uh... Yeah, I, I can't wait. Um, and I think also this accusation, uh, you know, I think we talked about this, this accusation is also posed to someone like Raid of like, you know, being inside and also like, oh yeah, like you 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 are not politicized. And and, and of course it's like, what do, what do you mean by politicized? Like, do you, do you mean like it, it happens on the level of the text or does it have to happen outside and, and why does it happen? And and I feel also, you know, like on a larger scale, I feel like that's that has been always an expectation for the so-called post-colonial writer, you know, like that they have to, you know, be politicized or take a stand against something, you know, while you, you will never see this about Western writers. They can be free, they can write about anything, <laughs> you know, but like we have inherited this. And even though I'm someone who does believe, like, of course, in like writers do have a role, you know, but uh, I feel like there's something uh, violent about, about such expectation and about, uh, um, you know, such accusation. And, and like, I, I think also even the, the line you said about Whitman, it's like, 
almost all of his generation had this re realization of like, oh, America is not, is not Whitman's, you know? And like, they all wrote these poems about like, you know, killing the Whitman figure even, right? Like, cause, <laughs> cause he is like, yeah. Um, uh, at like, yeah, like an illusion or something. And, um, and it's, um, I don't know, uh, but, but I guess like we can, we can maybe take a few questions, like um, see where this goes. Yeah. Already been answered during the the um, conversation, so apologies if we skip over those. Um, so Mona, uh, how did your opinion of his work change during and after the translation process? Um, yeah, I think my opinion only like got more. Uh, my let's say my love for him really and for his work only got more more uh, uh, complicated, you know, because as a translator, you you have all the time to like stop at the details and and you know grow an appreciation and get fascinated with uh, yeah with 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 the very process of creating right of of, of like these details because um, you know some of the examples I was just mentioning to Sinan you know like the titles the gendering the obscure adjectives um, the you know like the punctuation or lack thereof you know I. I felt all of that, you know, I was, um, um, I, I just like got to, to, yeah, like love them even more. And I feel like also um, sometimes I was, <laughs> I was even jealous, you know, like a, as a poet, you know, I was like, oh my God, I want to steal this title. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like, yeah. And, and, and um, so, so um, I think, I think this is the beauty about translation, honestly, like that's why you know, I selfishly say to people, I'm like, yeah, I translate people who I love, you know, it's like, because that's the joy of translation is that, you know, um, this is someone I have been reading since 2006, I always go back to reading him. And here I have like this opportunity and, and honestly, the honor to, to, you know, sit with his work and, and, you know, see it on a deeper level and, um, um, yeah, and, and, and see that, um, you, you know, like you, you somehow at some point capture that inner rhythm and you're like, yeah, like there is that rhythm and it, you unlock it somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and actually the, the next question we can jump into, um, you, you've, you've touched on this a little bit, but just to get into it completely, uh, what is your relationship to the text when you are translating it? Um, are you focused on maintaining the line and the rhythm of the original, or are you more concerned with first getting down the content from the Arabic into English and then reworking the line. Um, yeah, I think you know. I think it's it's uh, definitely a process in different phases. Um, I I feel like if you are someone interested in translation, maybe refer back to Robert Bly's uh, essay on uh, that. I think it's he calls it like the maybe phases or yeah of of translation. It's such a beautiful essay because he uses one of Rilke's poems and and he just like translated in, in, in different, uh, um, uh, like, yeah, at different uh, um, stages, you know, and at the beginning, you just like, you just sketch the skeleton and then slowly you add, you know, flesh and you add, you know, like the eyes and the hair and, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like it's really um, like a creation. Uh, um, so I, like this translation, I've been, even though you know, it's like, like it's a short, uh, like a selection really. And as you can see, most of the poems are really short, but it's taken me years because I would always, you know, go back and discover things that, you know, like maybe as a reader, I just take for granted, but as a translator, I can't, you know, as a translator, you have to like capture all the complexities and, and you, you're, you're the one responsible to, to like uh, carry that craft into the new language. Um, so yeah, it's it definitely like it, yeah, that's my process. I, I always take it in in different levels and different settings. And of course, you know, like sharing the drafts with people. Like Sinan, and I shared a draft with him, and it was beautiful. Like to see sometimes you miss some things, but you know, another poet or translator like gives you sees something else um, um, that completes the picture in a way or completes the the text. 
Um, Sonata, a question for you. Um, we, we got into uh, Mona's sort of introduction to Rod's work. Um, can you talk about your own connection to it and, and maybe how it also informs your own writing and, and, and sense of uh, the Iraqi you know, poet, poetic landscape? No, I mean, I like Muna in a way. I'm I was always trying to to keep up with uh, what's happening inside Iraq, but it was very difficult. And you know, I I was a Mac person from the beginning, and actually I suffered for a number of years because uh, Apple was late into uh, the encoding, allowing us to read Arabic. So I was oh, yeah. for two three years because every Arabic website I go to, I just get gibberish. But it was a revelation because I had always been interested in, in the Iraqi prose poem because, I mean, I grew up at the time in the 80s. This, this was the hottest thing also. And uh, for me also, the, the, the Iraqi prose poem, I, sh I forgot to mention that, was in a way there are a few examples of the Iraqi prose poem being one way to write about, to, to refuse to write the kind of war and political poetry that almost most poets were forced to write in or fell into the trap of writing to get recognition or get material rewards. But some prose poets like Rad Abdel Qadr and others either did not publish or chose a different route. And it's important for the audience to understand the kind of the political resonance of the prose poem, that it was banned in a way in Iraq. I mean, when I was in the University of Baghdad, I was at the English department, but in the Arabic department, students could not write theses on prose poetry because of kind of the Ba'athist interpretation of culture and because of the, you know, the symbolic capital of the prose poem being somehow linked to foreign poetry. And because also I think of Adonis's initial position with the Iranian revolution. So, uh, prose poetry and the prose poem was seen as uh, this degenerate form that is against the values of Arab culture. Mm -hmm. And a number of the uh, daily newspapers had cultural pages that were very important. Only one of the five newspapers would publish prose poetry in its cultural pages. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, so, so uh, but Rad Abdel Qadr was a very important name but as Muna mentions in the introduction, he published an early collection early on and then disappeared for 15, 16 years mm. for whatever reasons. But I think it's a very courageous uh, act. Let's remember again, back then, and when you were a young writer in your 20s and 30s, the desire to, to publish and to be recognized and to be part, it takes so much courage, I think, to... Um, to not publish. And it, we have another example of El Brekan or others who either chose silence because they didn't want to be part of this cultural circus. They didn't want to compromise. But I was also, when, like Muna in a way, when these poems started to come out, it was a, 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 a revelation. And I, as I told Muna, I remember Saadi Yusuf, you know, a great Iraqi poet, probably one of the greatest living Arab poets. Uh, and, for, and even though he doesn't write prose poetry, but he has actually influenced generations of poets because of his search and the way he changed language. When Saad Yusuf, who was living abroad at the time, read that poem by Rad Abdel Qadir, he wrote an article where he said the Iraqi prose poem is doing very well. <laughs> and he said something about the joy of reading, which, which having talked about this rift between the outside and the inside and this entrenchment, it's a very important recognition from a major Iraqi poet. And one of the last poems that Rad Abdel Qadir wrote is actually dedicated to, to Saad Yusuf. So uh, Rad Abdel Qadir is, you know, one of these tributaries. I, I, I don't want to use the word fathers because of all the connotations of patriarchy, but I... I actually, ancestors, I think for us as poets and writers, you always know that there are ancestors that you look up to and that you will learn from. And to me, I mean, thanks to, I think what's important about this translation as with other translations is that it kind of reminds us and allows us to go back and read him again. And like all great poets, every time you read the poem, actually you realize that there are other layers. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing with Sargon. So Rad Abdel Qadir is a, 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 is a major figure in, in uh, 
I think I read in one of the interviews that he was a very modest man, but he told his wife, I think, one day you will know that you are living with a great poet. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, poets need a certain level of, it doesn't, the narcissism doesn't come out in his poetry, but he is a great poet. And yeah. you see here, this is a man with only four collections. And there are the other collections also are so important in terms of experimenting with even the, 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 the orthography and the way it appears on the page and being in conversation with the tradition of uh, Arabic manuscripts. So it's, uh, that's why I keep saying it's very important now because this is kind of a signal. Uh, this translation gives the Ra'ad Abdel Qadir a new life, afterlife in English but it also reminds all of us to go back and read him again. I mean, that's always what I think, what we can do to, the best thing you can do for poets we love who are dead is to read them again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, well, uh, I, I actually think that that's as good a place to end it as any. We're at the end of our hour. Um, so everyone, before we leave, one thing that I definitely wanna do um, is I want to post a link to purchase the book again in the chat. So in case you arrived a little late and did not see that, um, that is in the chat now. Um, it's a gorgeous translation as you, as you heard, as everyone heard. Um, so, uh, Mona, thank you so much for sharing this with us and thank making you. the time to talk about it this evening. And Sinan, for, for, for the wealth and depth of knowledge about all of this, this was fascinating. Um, I, I see a lot of regulars. I'm honored. Well, I see a lot of regulars in the audience and I know that they're having a good time. Um, so otherwise, everyone be well, click on that link, buy the book. Uh, we are open now for um, pickups if you're in the neighborhood. So please swing by and then hopefully, you know, as things change, we can maybe be heading to a bar after these events all together. But otherwise, everyone get vaccinated. And maybe Thank we'll you. Thank you, Sunan. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye.